name's Charles Hathaway. Thanks for coming out today. I Please. look forward to giving a presentation. <laughs> um, and I usually encourage people to interrupt me when I talk <coughs> because, uh, questions are a good thing. Uh, to give you some context, I work at uh, YadaDB, which is an open source NoSQL or not only SQL database. Uh, recently forked from another database called GTM. Uh, this talk does use YadaDB, but that's only part of the fun. What we're going to start with is a description of the problem that I'm trying to solve and then different techniques for how to solve it. All right. So before we really get going, I spent some time getting this work out. This is from a movie called Hackers. <laughs> a hit 1995 film. Uh, and what's currently going on is a kid named Joey is trying to hack Gibson to uh, get fed with his friends. And we're going to see how it works. A three digit password. This is what computers look like. Uh, That's the holographic memory. That's this legit, man. <laughs> This is quantum computing, right? Shouldn't we need light cycles in here? Um, did you license this properly? Yes, I did. Because okay. it's for academic purposes. Therefore, I'm allowed to do it. <laughs> Fair use commentary. Alright, I'm sorry. This is Joey. That's happening. Now, the keyboard. Listen to the keyboard sounds. Is that pin? Is that pin? That is pin July. Is that pin July? pseudo-slave terminal, I think we decided it was last time, PTS-23. However, from experience, if you cat PTS-23, it kind of screws up the user's terminal because half the input goes to them and half of it goes to you. So now they know they're being watched, it's no good. Right? There's a few other things you can do. You could look at the uh, slash proc slash file descriptor for whatever process it is that, I think I'm missing a slash in there somewhere, but anyway, uh, for whatever process it is the user has. That might work, except again, that screws up 
uh, their display so they know you're watching them. Right? None of these work. So how can we do it? Now, I suspect we have a few more systems engineers in here than not. So feel free to help me out here. Um, the first thing we have to understand is what a file descriptor is. Right? All, all it is, it's, a, it's a big fancy word that refers to a number which refers to a file for a given application. Right? It's part of the POSIX API, which Linux does implement to some extent. You have files for everything under Linux. So the slash proc file system is a good example. Everything, even a process PID, has a file. Most applications start with three file descriptors. Your standard input, which is FD0. Your standard output, which is FD1. And your standard error, which is the, uh, oops, oops, right? One of the cool things about Linux and POSIX in general is you can redirect where these things put their output to, right? And this is what we call piping. Uh, and so it's a very flexible system. So one would almost imagine you could you know, redirect standard in and standard out for a program that you spawn, right? This is a good idea. Uh, and there's actually a Linux script called script replay and script, which will record a terminal session for you, but they can't attach to an existing process, right? And since we're assuming this guy wants to echo terminal 23, he may not, the process is live, it's running, he may not have the ability to start a new one without making Joey aware. All right, so how can we intercept a uh, write to a file descriptor from a live process? When we write to a file descriptor, we perform a system call, right? Uh, usually uh, in C, we call print, f printf, or d printf, and those all come down to calling man to write. Does anybody know what the two is? The chapter of the menu page. What chapter is it? System calls. System calls. All right? So, the cool thing about system calls, as, as Gary astutely pointed out, uh, chapter two of the man page, which you can find by doing man man, and there's a few other things in here we're going to look at in a minute, including section three, I think. Uh, system call is a fundamental interface between an application and the Linux kernel. So that's how you go from user space to kernel space to actually put something to a file descriptor. Which means the kernel has to be aware of everything that's happening. So if we can convince a kernel to tell us what's happening, can we look at system calls? Anybody want to make a gamble on this one? Man to look at system calls. That's Oh, yeah. There it is. S, S trace. There we go. Oh, it's an S trace. Yeah. Yep. So S trace, uh, you can attach an existing process if you have permissions, and it will print out exactly what the system call is doing, along with which system call was called, like read, write, open, whatever. Right. Uh, the only problem with it is the output is kind of hard to parse unless you're that guy from the Matrix who handles the phones. Um, which I, for one, am not, so I can't do that. So what we're going to do is write a program to watch us as calls for us and record the data somewhere where we can later play it back, right? So the basic diagram of what we're trying to do here is take the existing process, attach um, S trace to the syscalls that it does, pipe that into a recording application which stores it somewhere, and then we have the option of playing back the, the, uh, inter the interaction uh, in the audit output, which is what the security guy is trying to do. A comment though, right, Joey, if you watch the movie, you'll later discover he was at slash root slash dot workspace slash something 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 garbage file. If he's at slash root, that means that he has compromised the system, right? So any audit trail that we have on that system now doesn't have a purpose because he can just delete it. So we need a way of replicating the data off of the system to someplace more secure, hopefully, than, than the system you already compromised, right? So uh, the S trace output, we're going to add in a few uh, flags to keep it simple. I'll explain these really quick. The dash P followed by the process ID that we're attaching to. Dash E is a uh, expression indicating what we're listening for, because there's things like open, close, I don't know, a bunch of junk. The only ones we're interested in is write and read. Dash XX says to print the uh, hexadecimal representation of the string. We'll talk about that in a minute. 
And the last thing is uh, dash S4096 in case they have a really big terminal. So the reason that we print uh, hex characters instead of just the ASCII characters is hex characters are mostly unreadable. Or not mostly unreadable, I'm sorry. There are many unreadable ASCII characters. All right, so by printing the hex, it's easier and more consistent for our tool to read it, parse it, and store it somewhere else. It's kind of just a, I'm lazy, give me something that works solution. Um, escape characters are encoded as invisible ASCII characters. And if you play those back in a terminal that has the same settings as the terminal which they were played in, at the same time, at the same, same exact unprintable character, you will get the same exact output. And in this way, you can watch a recording of the terminal session. Right? So, in order to store it, though, we have to be able to handle those non-printable ASCII characters. Has anybody tried to do anything like storing null characters in a MySQL string? It's kind of, kind of challenging. They don't really like you to do that. What they tell you to do is encode it in base64, uh, which, eh, you know, it takes a little bit of extra space. It's kind of annoying to encode it and de-encode it, all that jazz. So whatever storage mechanism we use, we have to have a way of storing the unprintable ASCII characters, right? Um, but I'm sorry, didn't you say that you were, you were grabbing it in hex so you could store it as hex, right? We could store it as hex, but that means that it's each character... It's a lot bigger than it's bigger, right? Right, each character is now four characters. Mm -hmm. So storing it that way is kind of, it could be done. Right. Um, but depending on how many terminal sessions you're recording, that could result in four times... And I guess you could store them as blobs too, but... Right. You run into, yeah. But it gets kind of annoying. Uh, I will comment, if you had a 14 terabyte hard drive, storage may not be an issue. There you go. <laughs> but I do not have a 14 terabyte hard drive. If somebody wants to provide me with one, we're going to store the uh, plain, perverted back ASCII message, including all the null terminating characters and all of the other weird non-printable characters. And uh, by the way, it says Yada DB at the top right. and. One of the reasons that it says that is it's a very cool database that can store these non-printable, null terminating, I'm sorry, including null terminators, arbitrary length strings uh, without encoding them. So we can just store it as binary data, even though it's a database. Right? Another thing that's kind of something to consider is these events, because we want to play them back, are time sequence. So we want to know if this keystroke happened at this second, this keystroke happened at this second, and this one happened at the next second. So some way to store them such that we can pull them back in a linear fashion at approximately this amount of time that they occur would be helpful, right? And for reasons of C is a cool language, and it's not Go, and it's not Python, and we're old, core, old, old school hackers from 1995, we're going to write it in C, all right? Pre, yeah, it should be pre ANSI C, really. Yeah, you really shouldn't oh. be <laughs> No. I mean, what was that guy at the beginning with the Mac? And you thought that was probably like Pascal code, right? Like on, the, on that Mac. <laughs> We're writing it in C because I don't know Pascal. <laughs> it's close enough. All right. There was C back then. Lightspeed C for the Mac. Lightspeed. Okay, that's fine. That's what I'm coding in. Why not? <laughs> Nobody will pick up my typos anyway, so we'll be good. Mm -hmm. All right, so uh, SQL databases from C, has anybody tried that before? Um, the only experience I have with it is going through Qt to do SQL database access, and it's kind of a pain in the neck to set up. Uh, has anybody done development with Qt in particular? It's like a 500 megabyte library because it includes all the GUI stuff that I don't need. So we're not going to do that. Um, some NoSQL databases I found do have drivers for C, but they are not very straightforward to use. Um, and on top of that, they're kind of big, and they require daemons in the background to be running, and there's a whole another layer of complexity with it. All right. So what we're going to use is Yada DB, which does not have a daemon, uh, has a pretty straightforward C API, and as a bonus, it has features in it to replicate data from a source to another server somewhere. All right. The value to that is Joey now can't delete it now that he's compromised the Gibson. Uh, caveat about that though, something not everybody sees every day is that it's a hierarchical database engine. What this means is that we store data in a series of keys where the combination of the keys creates a unique uh, subscript mapping, right? So 
For example, if we had the keys person, Hathaway, and Charles, we could use person, Hathaway, and Charles to fetch a value from the database. Right? And this is conveniently a way we can store time. Right? So what we're going to do is we're going to just have the word sessions followed by a unique session ID. The second that the interaction occurred, so either the right or the open, followed by the middle second, so we have a little bit more granularity. And then for each of these things, we're going to have three kinds of values. We're going to have the function that was called, which is either going to be read or write. The file descriptor was called up. The ones we're interested in are file descriptor 0, 1, and 2. All right, because those were the standard out, standard in, I'm sorry, standard in, standard out, and standard error. So we're interested in those three file descriptors. And then uh, uh, the value that was printed. Right? That's kind of obvious we need that. So the way that we're going to do this is there's a uh, function that's used by Yada DB to iterate over a sequence of nodes in order. So we're going to go one, two, three, output it or store it, one, two, three, store it in order to uh, get the values. In order to, I'm sorry, store the values. So I'm actually going to try and create the program in front of you. Because you guys seem like you're hardcore systems programmers. You can ask questions about my totally legit what was it? Lightning C? Light speed C. Light speed C. <laughs> All right. Don't use a Mac 2. Crash there. <laughs> it's, a, it's a Linux user group, man. I could never do such a thing. Um, so we're going to start with some skeleton code because it's kind of boring to watch me do something that we've done a thousand times. Uh, so we have a routine which parses S trace output. Um, and hopefully I have an example of that further out. We'll get to it. Uh, and then we have a routine that parses the input arguments for the function. I'm sorry, for the program. So like, you know, dash VVV was mentioned earlier for SSH, or uh, in the S-trace example I gave, dash P, blah, blah, blah. So I, I don't feel like writing that in front of you. I have that already written. And then we also have a CMake file to actually build it. So what we're going to implement is uh, two functions with the signatures void record session, which gets invoked when we're saying we want to record this PID. Right? And then playback session, which takes the session ID and plays it back to your terminal. There's a few things missing from here, like I don't have a way in here of listing the recorded sessions. I leave that as an adventure for the person who wants to take this up next. Uh, and so, so some actual examples of the data we're going to store. We have uh, sessions followed by the second that it occurred at. I'm sorry. Session followed by session ID is 2, followed by the seconds, which is 1762. The middle of seconds, the file descriptor 1, which in this case means standard out. So we wrote to standard out at second 1762, and we wrote the value OK underscore $C10. Right? And $C10 is just the way this database encodes non printable ASCII characters when you ask it to print that, mm. which seems pretty reasonable. Uh, just a quick overview of the program flow. I don't know why these are different colors. I apologize about that. Um, the main routine calls the parse arg function, and then it either calls record session, which does a bunch of stuff. We'll, we'll write all of that out in a minute. Or it calls playback session, which you can see on the left, uh, which plays it back to the terminal that you're watching. All right, any questions so far? 15 minutes, is anybody asleep? <laughs> I'm what? It's kind of late, so. All right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Sorry, guys. It's all right. We know you're tired. It's fine. Sorry, guys. I have to you know, keep myself act entertained. So uh, we're going ahead and implement the uh, record session function here. Yeah, I'm actually curly bracket up there. Do I? Yeah, you do. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Maybe I'll fix it at one point. I've been practicing this, man. If you're given a presentation, you need to practice. Bonus points for using the eye. It's also no, it's replaying the, <laughs> the session that you've done before. It's screwed, up. it's screwed up. The game is gone. Oh, no. <laughs> what? Was this terminal 23? <laughs> no, this is 24. Oh, okay. Let's try that again. 
caught somebody's been monitoring. Shh. <coughs> there we go. That's, that's there we go. Maybe working better. Who knows? I don't really know. There we go. Okay. No. Nope. Ah. No. Oh. You know what? We're just going to look at the file and I'll explain it. How does that sound to everybody? And I great. swear, it worked at the last demo, right, Charlie? It did. It worked great, yeah. last I, it worked great I, at the last I believe demo. you 100%. And I haven't touched it. It's probably 100%. Good. I believe you 100%. Resize your screen. Yeah, resize my screen. Um, All right. One more time. <sighs> the amazing thing is that it worked okay on the crazy setup at um, in that lecture hall. Yeah. You know, yeah. USB, yeah. right? It looks really weird. It's doing something. It's doing something. <laughs> yeah, we'll just look at the code. Okay. Fine by me. I love this plan. I'm proud to be part of it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad I thought of it. All right. So, uh, so our goal is to write data to a database, right? Um, first thing we're going to have to do, because Yada DB aims to be very efficient with the C API, and that when it stores values, we don't want to malloc them over and over and delete them and may have malloc them over and over. Because um, let's say we had 10,000 hackers, which not to spoil the movie, but if you watch it, that does maybe happen. I strongly encourage you to watch it. It's a tremendously great movie. Uh, so we want an efficient way to do this. What we do is initialize a Yada DB buffer uh, to a given size. And then we, uh, when we fetch a value, we put it in there. And then when we want to get rid of it, we just set the size to zero and leave the bits in there until we put another value in it. Right? We have to set up the few literals that we talked about. And the first thing we do is we increment the ID counter, which is uh, the ID of the last session that played. Now, this increment operation is atomic. So if we had 10,000 hackers logged in at once, it goes up once for each hacker, and they get a unique ID guaranteed, unless something's really wrong with the universe. Right? After that, we just echo what terminal we're recording, and then the fun begins. Right? So first thing we do is a uh, fget s. And this actually presented trouble to me. Has anybody ever done uh, C coding where they had to deal with uh, interrupts? No. No. Okay. Yeah. So 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 interrupts are really, thirty years ago. Yeah. Well, what are you gonna do? So what what was happening to me here is that the database fires an interrupt if it doesn't hear from something in some amount of time, right? And uh, it turns out that fgets, when it gets interrupted, it gets grumpy. And it would come back and say, sorry, that was the end of the file. You have to start over. So we had to wrap a loop around it to make sure that that interrupt didn't bother us. Right? Then we um, extract our string. And if we have a valid line, we go ahead and move forward with it. People see this at all? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's, that's good. <clears throat> all right. Um, so we get the time, which we're going to use the time to index the data, which allows us to quickly traverse it, and it gives us a convenient way to play it back in order. Right. And then we're using the time as a for this guy. Doesn't uh, S trace <clears throat> give you time? Yeah. It does have the option to give you time. Yes. You're not using that. Though. I'm not using that because that's additional parsing. Uh, and as a side note. For anybody out there who writes parsing things, please be careful. That's like a really dangerous place to get bumper overflows. He's making faces. I don't know if he agrees with me or disagrees. Yeah? Oh, I agree. Okay, C good. is horrible for that. And he's a published author, so you can trust him. <laughs> so, uh, so, so, uh, I don't know that. So that's why you that's why you write a parser generator in PCCTS for C. PCTCS? It, 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 you've heard of Antler? Yeah. It's, it's the C predecessor to Antler. Ah. Okay. I actually have a question. In terms of parsing, are you are you typing the output of S trace into this program, or yeah, is there some so sort of like C API to to S trace? So I'm piping the output to this program. However, there is. Right. That was the part that you didn't show us, right? The, the, right. You said on that last slide. You right. Yeah. Yeah. Let me show you really quick. So what we're going to do is. No, I did. You're. I want to show you now. Okay. So, one, seven, two. Right, so, echo. 
So here's what the output of uh, S trace kind of looks like, which I mentioned it's difficult to parse. Down here, let's see if I can zoom in, is the right where it wrote my uh, whatever prompt, that prompt. prompt thing is called, PS1 or whatever it is. Right? And if you scroll up, you can actually see where it read in what I typed right here, probably. No. Yay. Right? There's the D, the L. So, yeah. Um, the problem with this is some characters, like the quote, are now escaped. This makes parsing a little bit more difficult. So, by adding that dash XX, we transform it to be a universal. Backslash one two three backslash one two three, which makes parsing much easier if you're lazy. Right? Did that answer your question? Um, and is that that's and that's what this program is getting as input then, or are you doing some pre-processing on it? That's what it's getting as input. This. Uh, oh, this is playing back still. So. <laughs> this extract string function parses it using a. Uh, not Antler parsing routine. What's Antler? Uh, Antler is a it's a it's a parser generator. It's um well, mainly out of the Java world, but it's it can can generate parsers for you know for uh, various different languages from a single specification. Right. That's a whole other topic. Yes. Right. So you could parse that, but it's not fun. And yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. yeah. It's regular. Yeah, it's regular. It's easy to parse. I just grab the quote here, the quote here. Yeah. I don't actually do that. I don't actually do that. I have states and everything. Um, but anyway, so we take those values and we put them into the database. Putting them into the database is as simple as this YDB set S call. Uh, the first parameter is the name of the global. Uh, one of the reasons that it's that way is within YADDB, you can separate the database into multiple files. So if you're recording 10,000 different sessions, you'll say sessions 1 through 100 go into this file, the next 100 sessions go into that file, the next 100 sessions go into that file. Or you could add a set subscript that says we have a, a session on a particular machine that goes into its own file, something like that. So the global name followed by the number of subscripts, which if we remember there are four. There's the ID the second, millisecond, and then the type of thing we're putting there, such as a uh, file descriptor, and then the value. Uh, I'm sorry, and then we do the same thing for value and function, and that's all there is to the recording aspect, right? So it is a relatively small amount of code for C, right? Because C tends to be, it's not, it's not Java, but it's still a little bit verbose, right? So that's pretty straightforward. Now, playing it back, which I'm very upset that it worked, by the way, uh, but is not much more different. Let me actually try something really quick to see if I can. Anyway, uh, so we start by setting up the exact same buffers we did earlier, except that this time we're going to read in the session from the uh, arguments passed to this program when it gets created or when it gets executed, right? Now, this is where we get a little bit interesting. I mentioned the dollar order function, right? That's what this YDD node next S is. So what that does is it says, our data is organized hierarchically. I want the next element in a depth first search of our hierarchical database, the next thing which has a value. Correct me if I'm wrong, Oscar. No, so it's depth first. Okay. Subscript next is first. Okay. Right. So this is depth first. So what we're going to do is we're just going to put the session ID and ask for the next node, which because we organize our data by time, the next node which has a value in it happens to be the first keystroke that happened when we started recording, which is very fortunate. Right. So the first thing we do is we convert the file descriptor, which uh, we recorded file descriptor, function, and value. Alphabetically, file descriptor, fd, and function. We convert that to an integer. We query for the next node, which is the uh, function, 
which is going to be either open or write, and then we query for the next node, which is going to be the value. Last thing we do is make sure that our function is either write or read, since those are the only two, I'm sorry, just write, because I didn't want to echo my passwords. I had no interest in doing that. Um, it's Hunter 2, right? Hmm? It's Hunter 2, right? It's, it's God. Okay, all right. It's Hacker or something like that. Got it. Right. It's, it's my idol. Uh, so, anyway, we make sure we're writing, and then we print it out with uh, this line right here. Right? Just prints it to the terminal, and then we're done. And that's all there is to echo it. Questions? Except the demo didn't work, which kind of sad. I think in this case, thinking about the scheme of your application, you just left out that you wrote an exploit, but you really need to work in the subscript mix, which is essentially flat. You don't have it. Right. No, no, that's, I did that on purpose with this. That was a tactical decision. But yes, if there was a node in there, suddenly we're not doing sequences of three, which means that this would not work. Right. I'm going to really quick. Yeah, you guys can, you, can you go back to the. Sure. Okay, so when you so you're pulling out whatever got printed and then whatever got saved, and you've got to decode everything, and then you do an f printf. But you said there might be null characters in there, so isn't that? I would I would have thought you would have been doing something where you were giving it the like the length. You're of right. The I should be calling right. Well, Put should it. I? No, I shouldn't because it's the null characters are normally interpreted by the C language. No, that's not true. You're right. I should be doing right. Why don't you try changing that? Let's try changing it and see what happens. Mm, what? It, 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 no, well, I mean, it, it, you need a length then, and like, I don't. Yeah. All right. Are you happy? I mean, I'm just. I mean, it was, it was, where, 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 I don't it's interesting. Interesting. It seems because, like it was working before. Yeah, it worked last time. What? What is You probably don't have any nulls. That's. That could be. Yeah. Well, that's, that, that seems unlikely. No, I don't think but, that's that. Yeah, it looked like your problem was something with the terminal configuration. Yeah. Really I was going to open a new terminal and see if that worked any better. Yeah, that seemed like a problem. Because last time there was a trick, the projector at the uh, University of Sciences is very low resolution. So this yeah. took up the entire screen, which was perfect. <clears throat> Output there. It's no, no, it was doing a print of a percent s. It wasn't feeding the, right. the string as, as a format uh, that's, string. That's true, right? So it's in there, so it's not going to so, but, you, but you're right, if there were nulls, but I don't, I don't think real terminals really no, if you do a percent, use nulls. If you do a percent much. s and then that string, and then the string, which is the second to last parameter, has a backslash n, it would still count. No, it would print the no, it would print the backslash, yeah. If the string was not null terminated, bad things will happen. Yeah, well, that's certain. No, mm -hmm. actually, you know what? I think that's addressed. I think the string will always be null terminated because unless I'm mistaken, I do this. So the string will always be null terminated. I think the main issue is that there's a chance there's a null character in it. I just got lucky with the demo that I gave last time that there were no null characters. Okay, it's working here. It's because I resized the terminal. I screwed it all up. All right, so uh, any questions about any of that? The demo went a lot faster because I was actually able to skip this part, so I apologize about that. It's okay. It's a cute demo. It is when it works. <laughs> and the last time
time it was great because it worked. And so we got to the end, and A, uh, you watched me write the application while simultaneously watching the written application play back the application I was writing. It was much better than this time around. I blame the high resolution monitor. <laughs> okay. Um, that's it. So, thank you. I apologize about the short presentation. Uh, unless anybody has questions, I guess we can do something else. It is on GitLab. Um, it's not finished. In case you didn't pick up on that. <laughs> um, but I think it's. Uh, yeah, yeah. Do you know of anything that does the same function? No, that's part of why I'm here, because it sounded really interesting. So there's some things that will attach, like I mentioned, script and script replay. There's also pseudo replay, which do similar things. But none of them store the data efficiently. So if you were in a uh, corporate environment where you had a requirement that you have auditability of your terminal sessions, for example, at a hospital, this type of tool would have value. And to my knowledge, there's not one out there. I think there would be some commercial offerings, but I don't really pay attention to those. So They don't exist in my world. Right. Um, I mean, I've messed around with screen, doing it with, but, but then you have to get it. Right. You know, everybody has to be using screen, and right. they have to not exit it, and you know, all that the so, the same principle well, there. Yeah, I just use screen because I'm a dinosaur. <laughs> what? <laughs> no, that's there's there's anything wrong with that? that. Tmux doesn't. Still, because <coughs> I, I mean, well, that's yeah, possible. Well, I haven't really. I can't say I can't. I, I don't yeah, really follow yeah, Tmux. Yeah, so. That was my impression. Yeah, there, there were. And it might have actually been the thing we're talking about, where you can send screen commands from inside it. And I actually had a, a script years ago where I had a capture. I had a capture stuff that right. was happening, and the only way I could figure out how to, it was it was atrocious. So I won't go into the details, but the only way ultimately I could figure out how to do it was the script sent commands to screen to start capturing itself right. to a file, and then stopped at the end when when I was done. And and I. I believe at the time when this is like five or plus years ago, Tmux didn't do that. And I don't know if it does now. I mean, if you have interest in this, I'd be glad to give you the source code. Help you I know nothing about C. Like, I wrote C in college many years ago and never again, so. <coughs> we'll get into the Debian repos and he'll, he'll be happy to. He'll be my beta user. <laughs> <laughs> There are proprietary tools that will do this, and they're not widely advertised and they're sort of promoted to corporate IT types. Like, you know, you can find out what your employees are doing without the employees knowing that kind of thing. Because the employees that type at a terminal are the ones that are always up to this job. Well, they're hackers, obviously. Oh, you're, sure. oh, that, you're right, I'm sorry. Sorry, those are the ones you got to watch out for. I used to work at a certain large company in the area, and they decided that they would track all the browsing that everyone was doing. And <laughs> after a very know. short amount of time, they got rid of that because the worst offenders were the people up at sea level who weren't going to have themselves tracked. Yep. That was 100% predictable. <laughs> <laughs> so this would not be something that you would immediately implement at the time you were being hacked? No, you would, you would have to do this ahead of time. And uh, So actually, last time I was hoping to talk about this and I didn't get a chance. Um, how do you make it so that any terminal that spawned attaches this program to it in such a way that a user can't simply kill it? Very carefully. Very carefully. <laughs> well, so that's <clears throat> easy to follow. But... Right, but I have to know that you spawn a terminal to attach S trace to it. So, so if I were a corporate okay. system trying to do this, it's kind of a different. You could you could work yourself you right, right, you know, periodically to make it harder to identify what process. You mean if you were an adversary? Or no, you're you're no, saying you're saying I'm going to switch the PID of. Yeah. Could you do this as a as a kernel module or something like that? Mm -hmm. so you want to say D trace? Is, is, I think that, that that might be a BSD thing. Yeah. No. 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 D, -tra D trace is starting to become available on Linux. Right. It's starting to. 
but it's more. I, I mean, it, it, it came from it came from Sun. Okay. It was it was a Solaris thing before, and then and then it got ported to it got ported to FreeBSD first along with ZFS. And only now is it starting to become available. What you want to do if you were to concerned about you know, capturing folk? Basically, we put S trace not just the reads and writes, but you know, S trace a whole bunch of functions, and then things like the read and write you want to capture, you capture those. Those that you know, like maybe someone does a fork in and for example, then what you want to do is sort of then fire off another one of these things, right. and then goes and latches on to the other process. So there's actually a parameter you can pass to S trace, which tells it to follow the forks. So you can and and. Actually, even just to get the output, because when you launch Vim, you know your, what your bash shell does is it does a fork. Your bash shell it does a fork, and then it does an exec, right? So in order to follow the fork, either of them, I forget exactly how that works out. You have to hash the parameter as trace to recursively follow things, which uh, oh, I can't type. I'm still doing it. <laughs> if, if, if you, if you um, attach the process like a debugger, which is what S trace is doing. You can then watch for the read and write system calls, for you know, exact and all those other things yourself. Yeah. Well, and that's that another way yeah. to do it. But it's kind of heavy. It's S trace is heavy in that regard too. Well, S and S trace is not connecting to the debugger. It's uh, it, I believe it's just monitoring the kernel level calls. No, P trace attaches to it. P trace does. S -trace, P trace is okay. different. S trace of it does not. I'm pretty sure it does. Because if you're S tracing something, you can't attach it with a debugger because they're both going to the same. I think you can actually. No, okay. no. You can try. I leave that as an <laughs> exercise <laughs> for the watches. Uh, did you yes. write this as a proof of concept, or like did you have a problem like issue that you were like trying to debug, or do you not say? Uh, no, I mean, we're an open source company, so all the source code that I work on is online, so no big secrets there. Um, it was a good demo that gave me something that I needed to store. It was related to a customer issue at an unnamed company, which uh, they had a similar issue and they did not find a solution available to them. So there may be demand for it, but not there yet. Like, well, like a demo where you're just dumping like tons of this like time series data into your DB is a good proof of concept. We have very good examples of ways to dump time series data into this type of database. Uh, one of the ones that Oscar likes to give is uh, monitoring brainwave activity, which there's a lot of info for, and dumping it into the database while it's running on the Raspberry Pi, which has a little bit more oomph than my laptop, a little bit less oomph than my laptop. Raspberry Pi Zero. Raspberry Pi Zero, so we're getting the smallest we can. Um, so go both ways. Let's scale up. Let's go back. Alright, is that thing still playing? No, so I, I added a feature so that I have to pull the button for it to play. Uh, I thought so. Okay. We can get it to go, like, <clears throat> once it finishes, I'll show you. If we get rid of this parameter, it'll just do its thing. And it looks all more magical. The only problem is, as I was writing this, I stepped away to use the bathroom right here. That's why. That's why you go in and hack the database. You know, to, to, take stuff to, to change the timestamps. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I leave it as an exercise for the watcher. <clears throat> It'll eventually. Well, yeah, but an exercise for the watcher to sit here waiting for you to get back from the bathroom is the. <laughs> <laughs> and you can see how good I actually am at typing with this. This is actually about how fast I type, which is not horrible, but I mean typos. All right, well, I think I've been standing here long enough. So, any other questions Any about this demo in particular, or about the database, or anything else that's going on?
Lights. <laughs> lights? What do you need lights for? Lights. lights. Come on, you lights. Yeah, these strange people in your oh. are freaking me out. People are going to start scurrying everywhere, too. Wait, wait, wait. Ah. You're also there. Okay, bright okay bright. I'm still freaked out. I was thinking you <laughs> said <laughs> No water, no water. It's on the side. I had to open up a few hundred miles. It's over here. It's 